Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our today. Um, so our session is Dancing with a Stakeholder. It's going to be actually by the University of Florida. So um, I want to go ahead and introduce everybody on the panel, and we'll go ahead and get started with the discussion. Um, so my name is Emily, and I work for the University of Illinois and I'm moderating um, DW um, from the University of Florida. We have Stacey Wallace, also from the University of Florida, Emily Flynn from Ohio Lane, and Lily Compton, who's joining us from Iowa State. Um, we really like this session to be a conversation. We want to invite everybody to share their thoughts and ideas uh, throughout presentation so we don't necessarily have to wait till the very end but I do ask that we let all of our speakers go first um, and if anybody has any questions in the chat I'll be monitoring that and I'll be able to answer it um, or ask them as we come to them so where was it oh basically um, when I was I, part of what got me really excited about this was um, some of you may know my mentor, Chris Shorey, and a few years ago, she did an uh, environmental survey of IR policy. Um, it wasn't just ETDs, but you might have been one of her survey respondents. Um, and I would like to start looking at the terms of the stakeholder context as it varies across our different types of institutions. I know there's going to be immense variety, but I'm hoping there are going to be some interesting parallels. Um, I was starting to briefly, I, we could talk for two hours about the University of Florida context, but we start at the core, our Stacy's unit and my unit and the libraries, the graduate school and the libraries working together, but we have our, our UF administration, we have the different departments and faculty, we have the students, we have the um, board of governors of the whole university system, we have the um, Oh, what's the proper name of the people who are U.S. Board of Trustees? Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees for U.F. itself. Uh, we have pressure from individual legislatures at times. Legislators at times. So it's a really fun and complicated environment. And within our, I would know the grad school and the libraries, there are of course factors at play that change and, and uh, needs to be met um, as as time progresses. Um, it is, I suspect, for everyone, a moving target situation. Stakeholders come in and go out according to budget changes and role changes and whatnot. So um, with that said, I'll pass to Stacy. Oh, okay. Um, I, I guess I, I will talk about our significant stakeholders, which in my case is, of course, the students and the faculty. Um, I think of them as my main stakeholders that are looking out for um, that I should be looking um, out for. And of course, then we, like GW mentioned, we have internal um, stakeholders as well that I obviously affect his workflow and um, he affects ours. So we have to work closely together to ensure that we you know, meet everyone's needs. Oh yeah, I did forget to mention ProQuest, sorry. <laughs> So pass on there. Perfect. Okay. There. How does that sound? <clears throat> I'm Emily Flynn with OhioLink. We are a state library consortia of academic libraries that all work together for group purchasing, and we also have available to our members the OhioLink ETD Center, where we have we have about 100 members that are part of OhioLink as institutions, including the State Library of Ohio. But we also, um, of those about 100, 36 of our OhioLink members contribute to the ETD Center. So they're submitting masters and dissertations from their local institution into one big, kind of like a consortial IR, the ETD Center, and they all can be searchable together. Um, they get picked up by Google Scholar as well, and they have the option of sending them to ProQuest too. So we try to streamline that all together. So as far as our stakeholders go, it's 
most of it is the local administrators from all of the institutions that run a version of the ETD Center and they can customize their workflows, their policies, they have all different sorts of staffing levels. The platform is the same, the submission form and the process is the same, but everyone does it slightly differently based on their timing. Some publish as they come in, some wait till the end of the semester, and they're able to do that on their own. And then if there's any troubleshooting or development, we work together with the administrators to get that all figured out directly with them. Um, in addition, we have uh, the ETD uh, community has a listserv for OhioLink, so we can communicate with the admins and any staff members or catalogers that are also working on ETDs can be on that listserv, and we have a place to communicate with them all. And then a subset, we have the ETD Council, which is a smaller group of four administrators from graduate schools and four library representatives and we make policy together or talk about uh, what should go into the next release and reviewing stuff like that. Ta discussing t hot topics as they come up. For a few years we've been discussing accessibility and now it's becoming part of our release and requirements so we're also addressing it from uh, policy and workflow standpoint with the administrators on the ETD Council and then that goes out to the, our wider community group too. So it works together and they represent the community. So they have that in-between layer for OhioLink and our consortial staff but then also the community itself. Um, those are our main stakeholders and we really work through them to do further outreach um, to whatever fits their needs on their local campus. As OhioLink, we have uh, different policy teams, and so they're an adjunct team, but we also have uh, the library directors, and all of our groups report up to the library directors and deans um, committee. And so even if new things happen on ETD Council, sometimes things need to go before the directors and deans group for all of our members as well. So they stay um, at a higher level uh, aware of what's going on and what's coming through, but it's really that local administrators level that's the main stakeholder, which is nice to work so directly with them at OhioLink. Good morning. I'm Lily from Iowa State, and um, in my institution, I'm housed in the grad college, but in the Center for Communication Excellence. So to say the least, my most direct or immediate stakeholders are the grad students um, and their faculty members. Our duty is to give them all the writing support from the beginning till the end until they graduate, right? Um, and I, I don't know if it's the same at your um, institution, but the grad college is a very different college compared to other academic colleges and the students can never understand why they're listed under two colleges their department and then grad college so who is the grad college well we like to say that we are there to support them so anything to do with etds um it's our view that we need to make sure they graduate they have what they need to fulfill their thesis or dissertation according to the needs or, or, or what their professors and committees view as necessary. We do not interfere with content. We just research what's the best practices to push that final product into the institutional repository and also progress since we are collaborating with them. Um, in, in the same vein, because we are the grad college and because we are the ones in charge of conferring the degrees, I feel like our ETD stakeholder too is the institution. So it is in our responsibility to make sure that the institution doesn't get sued. So that's why we've had an interesting talk about digital accessibility because it's the upcoming issue. So um, that's something that we need to look at. Copyright is another thing. Um, we need to work with the legal counsel, that's our stakeholder as well, because we deal with a lot of sponsored research 
And so we have to balance that need for students to get financial assistance, but still be able to publish their research and demonstrate that they have gotten the skills from the graduate program. So those are our primary and immediate stakeholders. Obviously, because we need to work with the library to get the uh, final product into the institutional repository, we have to work closely with them about their needs as well, how we get the workflow so that it doesn't mess them up, right? So I think those are the starting point of stakeholders, and I'm sure we'll get beyond that. Yeah, so thank you. I want to go ahead and ask a question in the session. Could you talk about the two questions? Could you talk a little bit about whose voices are allowed in particular groups? And then so what happens if you have two conflicting lab voices? How do you make sense of what they do? So um, an interesting one that we have that comes up, I think, for everyone throughout the years is the creative writing folks. And they are very, I would say, one of our loudest uh, stakeholders. Um, they, you know, are writing a great next novel and they really want to protect it and they want um, a permanent embargo, lifetime embargoes on campus. Um, that's not something that's, you know, our other thesis and dissertation students even have those options. Um, so I find in my case, every couple of years, um, I go through it. There, uh, the college wants to meet with my dean. We have big meetings. Um, we get into the meeting and then realize that the Department of English hasn't even settled this. So like they literally go into the meeting with folks from creative writing and then their chairs of the department and then start talking about, um, you know, well, I don't know if we want a permanent embargo. I don't know if we would want to block all of, you know, this access. And then you have very loud folks that are on the faculty that speak very strongly about why that, that would need to be the case. So I, like as the grad school, um, we often just put it back in their court at the department um, and then the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and say, you know, you folks need to figure this out and then come to us with a proposal of what we could then work with GW and the libraries to see how we can, you know, meet your needs. But that certainly comes up every couple of years. They are certainly... Um, have big restrictions at UF on on that, um, but like I said, they they often are arguing even further, and GW will attest. Then it became not just the creative writing students, but then the students that had been creative writing students at the master's level now moving into the PhD in English, and they have what a fifteen year embargo um, because of that um, available to them at our institution. All right, so for Ohio Link, because we're at a different level, um, we have to consider all the institutions who are using our platform. So for us, even though I might hear from a student offhand, I usually send them back to the different schools uh, because that's where all the policies come from, their timelines, everything is all unique to them. Um, so anything that would come up would come through the administrators themselves. A good point about the technical um, thoughts behind this is, um, you know, at Ohio Link, we're blessed to have some developers that we can work with. And so we're able to get on their project schedule. We work that with them for other Ohio Link things. We're part of the OTEC consortium in Ohio. And so we share infrastructure and developers and a technical um, IT support, especially overnight when all of us Ohio Link staff go home, <laughs> they still have the um, OTEC uh, answering calls on our behalf, making sure nothing um, fails. And if it does, they'll, they'll get it worked on right away, that kind of stuff. And because of that, we have these developers that know the Ohio Link platforms very well. Um, the ET Center is homegrown. They built it themselves, these developers, and last summer we uh, rebuilt the whole platform to make it 
faster and things work better, different layouts and putting in digital accessibility from the for the users end. Um, so it's it's really sometimes it becomes the the schools themselves want to do certain things. They have certain needs that they think that ETD Center should be meeting. And so part of it is working within them and within council to figure out what features do we need? What can we go for? And then Ohio Link then coordinates with the developers to say what's possible. How long is this going to take? Is it a heavy lift or not? I asked for this, what seems to be a little thing, and they say, the database isn't set up like that. That's actually going to take a really long time, really big effort. You know, is that worth the value back to the schools? And then we kind of have to sometimes negotiate that. You know, I want to give you one thing. It would be really useful, but do all the schools want it or need it? And then can we build it and how quickly can we build it? What's it going to take, especially with the schedule? Because the developers serve all of OTEC. And so it's not just our Ohio Link platforms. We also have to share them with the rest of our um, OTEC consortium. So some of it is, is negotiating that stuff as well. But thankfully, we can, as Ohio Link, work so directly with everyone that most of the time we're able to compromise and work things out um, with very few uh, things that aren't actually able to be handled. So as I said before, um, we want to prioritize the grad students but the voices that come through the loudest would be the faculty, right? And it's not a bad thing. It's because they're defending their students. And if you keep hearing complaints from a specific department, something is not right there. We, um, I used to have a, a format reviewer who worked uh, from Florida. Um, she's retired, so she would, she was really great at her job, but she would complain about this particular department and said, every time the student hands in, I have to send a major reject. And she was frustrated, the students were frustrated, the faculty was frustrated. The English department also started having the same issues with the creative writing because the guidelines that we had set up were not meeting your needs. And usually when these cases come to me, they come at crunch time and I can't do anything about it. But I make a note and then I go back to the faculty and it's like, what's going on, right? And if you start talking to them, you'll start hearing there's something not right because of the discipline. They are doing it a certain way and your rigid rules are not helping them, right? And so I started talking to history and I started talking to creative writing and they started telling me stories about the way research is written in your discipline and it completely blew my mind. It's not your typical way. The way that they structure, it's kind of like a story flow. I says, wait, I can create something that will meet both your needs, but it's not always the case either. Because then they, history says, we are journal style and creative is creative style. We don't want to be associated. Then I say, the template I'm creating for you is just like a very blank canvas with some presets there to help your students make it easier. No. So we went back and forth with the grad council, trying to get the template approved, trying to get the name approved. I'm like, I'm done. I just want to help the students. Here's a third template, and the file is called third template, right? <laughs> you choose your battles, OK? You choose your battles. We went back and forth with the names. One would say, yes, we're OK with that. The other says, no, we don't want to be associated with that. But essentially, the template is just trying to tell you, here's how you put your headers, here's how you put your whatever, and you can name it however, you can put however many chapters in there, I don't care, I don't look at the content. But we got that settled. Another issue is that faculty do things very differently in different departments depending on their kind of sponsors. So you have sponsored research, but then you have also labs that are not working the same way. Labs work across the United States. Their collaborators are across labs, not just Iowa State. And so I get fearful when my dean says, we need to meet with this dean because there's an issue. And so I go into the meetings like, what's going on? And they say, your 
requirements are too rigid. We can't produce this. We can't produce that. Like, Wait, what can't you produce? You're requiring us to give documentation that we have how many percent collaboration. The student did 50%. Well, I can't put a number on it. So that is not our goal to punish you. We are just trying to help our students make sure they tell their audience how much work they put in it, where, what is their role. And so if this template of consent is not accurate, tell me how it works in your lab. And so I can work another template there. It doesn't matter which template you use. What matters to me is that my student is protected when their ETD goes into the library and that somebody else is not going to say, hey, I've seen this research before. It's in a different thesis or dissertation. How come your student is doing that, right? Shared consent. And so, you know, that's what we need to do. Again, prioritize your faculty. They think you are the boogeyman. <laughs> but when you say, I'm here to support your students, let me know what you need. Listen to them, listen to their needs. They soften. And then you start saying, this is what you need. Here's the mock-up. Tell me if this fits, if it doesn't. Here are other stakeholders you need to bring in to have this conversation so that we can move forward. Once you have a proposal that you're happy with, then obviously you need to go to the channels that bless it, right? Here at Iowa State, it goes through the grad council. Nothing skips the grad council. So it then becomes my job to put this proposal, get the blessings of my stakeholders, bring it all the way to the next channel of stakeholders. So faculty, students. Of, um, what GW was saying, that is true. We're very much um, concerned about the readers. In fact, I think at this conference, I spent all of my evening last night talking about how we've got to improve accessibility and ensure that um, we're meeting those standards. So that is something that definitely is a hot topic um, here at UF right now. Uh, for Ohio Inc., it's definitely something that we get from the development side of things and thinking about the use of our platform. So we have two platforms. We have the public ETD center, and then we also have the back end, the submission site that uh, the admins really live in and use, and all the students that submit go through that as well before it goes up on our published public site. And the, the public ETD center is... The public ETD Center is uh, open access and almost entirely full text. So we do allow for abstract only submissions, but that's only if the school allows it. Yeah, I see we're getting some choppy audio. I'm going to try to keep continuing and hopefully it'll pick up better. For um, the development aspects, we think about the website and how it works well. The redesign last summer was entirely centered around that, making sure accessibility for the users was front and center. So we wanted to make sure that uh, that was a, a main uh, component to the, the redesign because the ETD Center last summer celebrated 20 years, which blows my mind. <laughs> um, and we have over 100,000 ETDs now that are all open access and available. So that is definitely something when thinking about it from a platform standpoint, um, all of our files are downloadable. Uh, so anything, um, they're mostly the PDFs still that get submitted, but we have supplemental files of any format that can be accepted. The council has recommended formats and um, even details such as like uh, compression or maybe preferred file type to make sure that things are in a common enough format that we can either carry it forward if we need to in preservation and thinking about formats later or even just openable later. So, you know, that happens all through each institution with approving the submissions and working with their students. Uh, but we do have some of those best, best practices into place as well. Uh, we also have, um, an ORCID ID that is optional, but some of our schools are requiring it. And so that displays on the public site. When you go look up a student's ETD, you see their name, their citation, the files are on the side, the abstracts in the middle. There's citations down below for the common formats that you might cite a work in to just help get it out there more, make that easier. And the ORCID link is right at the top. If they included it, they click it, 
and if the student's keeping it up or if they publish in a journal and that's adding citations, we'll keep building that way. So trying to think of both the readers and the authors as we put the public site together. And then of course, making sure the submission is smooth and that site works well. Um, that also got revised last summer in the refresh too. And you can ask, I see Terry and Tim and Kim in the room, ask any of them how it's working. You know, they're the ones to talk to about on the ground, how it works with their students and, and uh, the smoothness. And I can talk about it from a different level, but they've got the actual stories. <laughs> So I piggyback on Stacy's comment that the upcoming thing is about digital accessibility and making sure that your readers can access your, the works. But I'll not speak on that because Stacy mentioned that. So I'll talk a little bit uh, about um, thinking about picking up a dissertation or a thesis, right? You assume that somebody who's gonna pick up, the reader who's gonna pick it up is gonna read from beginning to end. It's not always the case. If you're a researcher researching on a topic, you've got a whole list of things you're going to skim through. So in as an ETDA person trying to think about new guidelines or archaic guidelines, right? Consider how the reader interacts with that manuscript, okay? Are you really going to expect them to read and search everything that they need to know? Or are they just going to pick up and say, I can't figure it out, dump it? Right, we have the journal style uh, dissertation that Stacy uh, Stacy yesterday defined as a manuscript chapters. So, in thinking about something simple like this, how do you organize a dissertation that has independent chapters? You need to make them self-contained, correct? So, everything that's pertinent to that chapter has to stay there. You cannot assume that if I'm going to pick up your dissertation, I'm going to read all three chapters. I might only read chapter four. So everything I need to know has to be there, has to be disclosed upfront. Whether it's been published, whether it's going to be published, whether it's under review, whether it's not going to see the light of day, whether it's in progress, everything, make it upfront for the review, uh, with, for the reader, okay? So in trying to maintain standards across the institution, we think about those kind of things from the perspective of our readers. What helps our readers enjoy interacting with this manuscript, even in a small bit of time? That's what guides us. I said, okay, sounds good. So the creative writing students we've not heard a peep from, so I don't know, I don't want to talk too loud about that. Just, you know. But anyway, we've had a different experience. Uh, and then I'll just say, finish with the, the, the role of the reader. Uh, I think that that's a great question. And because uh, when you think about the formatting, that we go through formatting guidelines really are there for the reader. I mean, it's to make our documents look good, but it's there for the reader to be able to access that document, you know, very cleanly. And as a matter of fact, we've, you know, over the last few years, I, I keep saying we, we've got in our formatting guidelines. And there were so many things, the archaic stuff that you talked about, you know, do we really care if the, if the header is in the center or on the left, as long as it's consistent. We want consistency, we want them to look good. Uh, we want the title page to look good. So, when they, you know, you can tell it's an Ohio State document, but beyond that, you know, we try to loosen things up. We want some structure so it looks good, uh, but we also want to make it so that that students, I don't know if any of you also have noticed in the last few years, the increase in supplemental files being submitted, supplemental figures, that must be a thing in certain disciplines that's happening. So I said, you know, we don't want to straight jacket them into this figure. They got to remember them all sequentially. If they want to say supplemental, fine. Just be consistent. And, and that probably helps with somebody in the discipline um, who is, um, you know, who's looking at that document, right? Because the student is formatting or putting things the way somebody in that discipline might understand. It. So, uh, so I think it's really very important to do this with the format, uh, format for documents for sure. Thank you very much. Anybody else? I'm a director of academic relations. Um, but I especially appreciate the focus of this. So, 
like to attend like to support open access, but of course, Customers have very high expectations for reader experience. And what that means is we focus a lot on reader experience. So, one of the things that we've done in the last year is to introduce a which allows the reader to immediately see which dissertations are associated and what the foundational research underlying that dissertation. This is uh, the sort of thing that I think many of us who are in, took graduate programs would have loved to have had, the paging through pages of references looking for to see and so this, this work. So yeah, I just want to I just want to you know uh, underscore that that focus on, on and share one other thing. Our former vice president used to call um, the the authors of the theses and dissertations, the heroes of the work that we do at Corpus. And I, I imagine there are a lot of folks in this room who feel that same way. The authors themselves are, are never to be forgotten, right? The, the, sort of the heroes of, of all of this, this work that we do. So with um, OhioLink being at the different level, I also hear from different campuses and they have different circumstances. And it's um, fun to be able to see those different perspectives, but it's sometimes difficult because it is based on people and it depends on your circumstances and just the right mix sometimes. To go a step farther, it, it depends on um, relationships sometimes too. We'll have some campuses that say, you know, I work so closely with my library. And another institution will say, I can't make a connection at the library. I'm in the grad school and they just won't talk to me about it. And it's just, I can't get something started. How do I do it? And sometimes campus politics or the way things are done or the people that are currently there, it's just a mix that's not quite right. And that's the tough part to just say like, Sometimes it's just kind of based on what goes on on your campus and how things work or if a policy needs to go through the grad council versus a smaller shop that might be able to just create something off the cuff as needed and make it a policy right away to put it into place sooner. So it, it's all unfortunately dependent, but I think that's a good question because there's um, something that came up recently and it was one of those, I said, you know, we just haven't talked about it in a while. Sure, we can try talking about it again and seeing. So it's it's that periodically either checking in or especially when there's a change somewhere, sometimes that shifts enough or just depending on the year, you know, all of a sudden everyone's talking ETDs and, and it doesn't matter so much to the department anymore because there's that value in being found online. And, and sometimes it's good to have a little interest in a manuscript because when you write a publication, Sometimes it's extremely different from the actual ETD that was originally formed, right? So sometimes being open access doesn't harm a work. Um, and we do have embargoes in place in case someone needs or wants one. So, I mean, that kind of give and take, but it just unfortunately kind of depends. Do you want to? Yeah. So I'm going to say, you know, we all wear multiple hats, right? So sometimes you just have to choose your battles. And the most urgent ones you can pick up and start doing your research. You have to do your research. There's a reason why you don't talk about it because it's so many generations ago, things have been buried. And think about your predecessors. Why did they not address those things? Because those things pop up at the wrong time when you have no time to deal with it, right? So when you actually do have an opportunity to explore and investigate, you can start going back to figure out where did that come from? Where is the evidence? Is it made public? Is it a mandate? Is it a guideline? Can you flex on it? 
who do you talk to? And as you explore all these aspects, you start getting a bigger picture of like, well, somebody just created this. Actually, it's not important. Well, okay, out with it, right? <laughs> or figure out who's the one can say, yes, my blessings, go out with it, right? Or no, it's a mandate, so therefore you need to start following protocols. Wait, protocols are not in place. You start figuring out what the protocols are so that it meets the mandate. And you put it public so that nobody's going to challenge you on it. But you also still need to go through the proper channels and then get blessings on it, right? In a different world, in a different hat that I wear, um, it has to do with testing. And that was it. We always made it a recommendation because we didn't think that we had any powers to implement that recommendation. Well, I always got challenged on it from the students, from the faculty, from the department. Why did they have to do this, right? And then I started exploring and digging and digging. And you know what? It was a mandate from the Board of Regents. It was right there. So I drafted the whole page that outlined the mandate and how we are helping to meet the mandate, right? It's now up there. Anytime I get more questions, I say, read that. <laughs> the department, read that. Faculty, read that. They don't challenge me anymore. It's the same with the ETD rules, right? If they are challenging you, do your research. Why are they challenging you, okay? Then explore, talk to other people. Is this the correct way? Is this not? Talking about accessibility and archaic rules, double spacing, huge issue. Some people like it, some people don't. I have to go and form a focus group just to figure that out, right? And then go to the grad council. I haven't done that yet. I have a list of people who want to be in the focus group, but there are so many things that I have to keep slamming down on, right? But in the meantime, digital accessibility came up. So I go to my digital accessibility coordinator to say, give me the guideline. What is digitally accessible? Because that is a mandate. In two years, Iowa State has to meet the mandate. I'm going to start now. What is your mandate? I will go with that. When I do the focus group, I would have come up with a proposal in my pocket, but I'm going to listen to the people, right? The ones who say, why do you have two lines? I understand that. We've explored that. Here's the here's the mandate that we have to meet. So sorry, no deal. Not one, not two. We're going to go with 1.5. Certain things you can fudge on, certain things you can't. Do your research. Thanks. Which I just wanted to add one thing. When Emily talked about the stress that sometimes uh, the grad school um, in the libraries have, um, that breaks my heart to hear that because in our case, we we try to ensure that we're meeting regularly. Um, we make sure that there's a big ETD stakeholders. We have a working group. Um, they meet each semester regardless of whether we think there's stuff on the horizon. Um, and the one stakeholders that I think we didn't really talk about here are also our supervisors, our deans, the people we have responsibility to ensure we're working together with the libraries and ensure that, uh, you know, we're meeting our dean's requirements while they are simultaneously meeting the requirements of their dean as well. audio quality and how to in front of the presenter. So you can laptop to so come on up here. Yeah, please come on up here. Maybe a little awkward. We're doing a little you know, a little bit of a little stage production here as well. Yeah, and then um, everybody can hear each other. And just have a seat and actually we'll broadcast. Oh, we just have a video camera. Yeah. When, you, when you're talking about stakeholders in general on a campus, or even when you're dealing with stakeholders, and I, I can see that you have, or for Ohio Link, you have a council set up so that you take a, a lot of people in in an umbrella type of environment, for example, so that everybody becomes a stakeholder. Everybody is together as a stakeholder, and you've got them in one tent, so to speak. 
And we do that with our ETD advisory committee. And anybody that's a stakeholder on our campus, such as a teaching and learning center or the library or whoever it happens to be at that time, is brought in as an ex officio member of that advisory committee. Now, the advisory committee itself is made up of a group of students and a group of faculty who have voting power, okay, in terms of advising with ETD policies. But it's very important to bring all of those stakeholders under one tent, so to speak. And I think that the ETD program in general should kind of aim in that direction rather than trying to go to everybody else all over campus, bring everybody in under one umbrella, deal with issues. So that's my two cents for it. <laughs> that's great, thank you. Uh, that's a great uh, point, and I think you're very lucky to have that set up on campus. Sometimes it seems, um, especially working with our various institutions based on even the, the grad school and or even if it so two thirds of our institutions for ETD Center are run through the graduate school or the graduate college and only a third are run through the library. But either way, it seems um, it is often just a portion of someone's job and there might only be one staff member doing it and it is part of a requirement to graduate. And so I think on some campuses, it's, it's not an afterthought, but it's already part of a process that's built in and it might not have enough time or um, departmental structure to allow for these larger conversations sometimes, just based on what happens. And so that staffing can be really crucial, I think. And it's excellent that you have this local committee, advisory committee that you can do with um, multiple stakeholders talking about ETDs. I just don't think it's possible on some campuses or hasn't been done yet. Maybe it's possible, but you gotta work on it. And if you don't have additional staff and it's just part of your job and you've gotta run the grad school or you're a librarian and you just have to get these things in and approved, you know, it's a very different place to live in sometimes. So it goes back to that campus culture and um, it, it seems to me that ETDs could be their own um, department in some ways, given how much work everyone puts in and to really get into some of this or you know, to have its own um, professional space. And we're lucky to have these conferences, but it always seems all too brief for me and just a slice of everyone's job. So that's kind of um, what stuck out to me over the years. And I'm, I wish it'll keep growing, right? I hope so, because it sounds like everyone could always do more and wants to do more, but it also takes that time and people effort too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're nearing the end. Well, no, we're at the end of 